So um, building a team is one of the most critical things that you can do as a founder. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of make or break in a lot of ways, um, but it's usually not irreversible if you get the wrong team member on there. But one of the things that I would say is like, you know, I get questions all the time. Do I have to have a co-founder to get funded? Answer, no. <laughs> like, do, you know, when do I need a board? We're going to talk a little bit more about when you need a board. What's the difference between an advisory board and a board of directors, which is another whole nother entity. Um, you know, when should you use contractors? Um, how do you use advisors? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about equity as it relates to that. So like what your cap table looks like, um, being able to, um, you you know, reserve shares for key hires, things like that. Um, and then also vesting and what like a sort of standard kind of vesting. And I'm not going to get super far into the weeds on some of those things. I know um, Genevieve may hit on some of those things next week as she dives more deep, more deeply into cap table and really talking about financials as it relates to startups. So it really matters what stage your startup is at. And let me go see if I can go hang out and find chat and figure out where people are at in this uh, world of startup three years ago. Okay, so definitely a fair number of folks that are. Um, so when you're early on as a startup, almost always you're running in a bootstrapped manner, right? So typically it's the founders that have a passion for it. Um, they have a vision, maybe you're getting some outside grant funding, and maybe you're self-funding it, um, but you're really sort of operating um, as lean as possible. And at that stage, typically a team looks like the founders, the co-founders, maybe there's a graduate student involved if you're spinning out of a lab, maybe there is a contractor involved if you have a particular thing that you need to get accomplished and you don't have the skill set yourself, but it's typically not a huge team. Often there's definitely no one that's an employee of the company for the most part, if anybody's getting paid at all, it's typically in a 1099 fashion. And so that's really the the sort of early days. Um, as the company starts to grow and maybe you get a little bit more outside funding, thinking thoughtfully about things like, for example, um, when my co-founder and I were looking at, you know, where our startup was headed, it was very clear to us that we're not planning on building a big team. We're really planning on getting to MVP, road testing with some strategic partners, and then partnering to sort of take this to commercialization. And so there's a lot of hires that we don't need and that helps us make decisions about, well, do, do we really wanna create an engineering role or position for somebody to come on board when we know that we're just only doing this for a short period of time. And so in those sorts of situations, it's how you think about that that relates to whether or not you sort of create a position or whether you hire an outside. In our, our case, we ended up hiring an outside team that had a lot of experience commercializing in AI um, software. And so we did all of the basic research and all of the tech, you know, all of that side of it. And then now we're working with an outside team to do that. So it really depends on the nature of the goals of your startup and then also. Um, you know, sort of the concept of, for example, am I going to go through the process of, of bringing on employees and um, thinking about what that looks like if, for example, this position is only needed to get us through this, this particular milestone and then that position is no longer going to be needed. So it's really not just about what stage you're at, but sort of the concept and how much money you have from the outside, but what makes the most business sense overall. And so it gets really complicated in terms of trying to figure out how to hire. So as you move further along and you start getting actual C, you start getting actual VC or angel money into the company, they are going to expect that you're going to build your team. And that's part of typically what they're giving you money for, right? They understand and any good investor should not expect you to work forever for free for your startup. So that's something also for you to know. So if you're a founder, you are a part of the team. And at some point in time, you should be getting some kind of compensation from the startup if you're raising outside money. And any good investor is going to expect that you do. It needs to be a reasonable amount. Nobody's, you know, jetting off to private islands and throwing parties kind of startup founder, but but 
for sure, it's important that you have also some compensation. Startup founders who are burning the candle at both ends or needing to try to bring in outside funds, um, that's not something that a VC is going to want. And so they're going to expect that you're also going to pay yourself. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is one of the most difficult times in the startup the startup pathway is when you move from that like really core team to starting to bring on outside, um, you know, employees, growing your team, building the company, um, and you have less sort of hands-on daily control of exactly everything that's going on. And it's a really good time to take a pause and think about like the corporate culture that you want to create and also a really good time to engage maybe outside HR or some other kind of, and I know like, for example, ULP has great assets related to that in terms of like early hiring. And, um, you know, it's not something to be taken lightly. Number one, there are laws around this. <laughs> so like what a contractor is and what an employee is. And so you don't want to run afoul of that because it could be really a problem for your, for your startup. But also, um, but also um, part of the issue there is that um, you uh, also want to sort of set the stage for what this looks like moving forward, right? So creating the right processes, creating the right onboarding. I'm just onboarded in a new organization and that included, you know, a series of steps meeting with lots of different people and making sure that you have some kind of processes in place. And also like the recruiting side of it, um, thinking about who the, you know, what is a cultural fit for your company? And then also where are you going to find these uh, folks that are, are going to be working for your company as a part of that process? And so it's it's can seem a little bit overwhelming, especially if you've never grown um, an organization before, but it's something that what you want to do is make sure that you are um, thinking about it early. Um, and I'm going to try to, for some reason, my advance. Oh, there we go. So um, team is one of the top reasons startups fail. So I just want to be very clear about that. And for a number of different reasons, um, one of the things that can happen is that co-founders ultimately are not a good fit or there's problems within co-founders. And I'll tell a little bit of a story of where I had to jump in and help a co-founder that I had invested in um, with negotiating um, one of his early co-founders sort of out of the company. And that's always a struggle and a hard thing. Um, so um, it's really important to think about like, what are you bringing to the table? What are your co-founders or early employees bringing to the table? Who's going to be working full-time in the company and who obviously might have to have other outside income until funds come in, et cetera. And, um, and there's some great resources and I will try to find some of them. I tried to find some of them last night and was not able to, but I've seen them where it's, it's kind of like a gauge of like who should get what because how much they're working and and setting those expectations early are really important because having those conversations with your co-founder now versus when it looks like your company may actually be worth something <laughs> um, and, may, and there may be an exit is a really good thing to do because uh, as soon as those sorts of things start happening, people's egos or or other things can get involved and it can be a real problem. So make sure that you have goals and values alignment. Um, you know, it's important to know who you're going into business with. And um, I would not take any kind of a co-founder situation lightly from a perspective of, especially if you're on a venture track, like this is the commitment that you have. And it is going to be a big blip and difficulty if you have a co-founder that leaves because um, VCs are going to, or other funders are going to view that as a, as a real problem for the company it can be recovered from don't get me wrong but it's it's definitely can be an issue and then timing is everything and it's kind of as i mentioned before when i sort of looked at that stage of like where are you in that pathway like you don't want to stuff up or too early um you know i don't know um if any of you are in the bay area that are that are dialing in but you know there's just been these massive massive rounds of tech layoffs in the startup world and part of that was because they were getting thrown money. Um, and in many cases, they staffed up more than they needed to, right? Because they had that money and they and they grew, you know, beyond the necessity of what they needed to as a company. And so um, it's a critical component of, you know, when do you when do you staff up, right? And um, and when do you start making those? Um, and then um 
hiring people who are not executors. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute because um, I've seen this all too often in startup world. So this is a lovely, happy picture of a team, a lab. I don't even know if this is a startup, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the fact that a life science startup and hiring is a little bit different than maybe a tech startup or a software startup, right? Um, typically, you're going to have a physical location. You may have people that are going to need to commute into the lab. You may have people that are going to be working together in close quarters or, you know, um, on, on research projects. And so really getting a sense of, um, you know, who they are as people and whether they fit or fit into the team is going to be super important, but also just their skill set you're going to be hiring for is, is typically very different than a lot of other startups. Um, but what you look for when you hire sort of spans a lot of that. And I think some of the, the common mistakes that, that I see happening with startups are you know, looking at whether somebody has startup experience or not. It's not a deal breaker if somebody doesn't have startup experience, but one of the things that you have to understand is if they come from a large organization, it might be difficult for them to move into a startup because there's a lot more ambiguity. There's a lot more, you know, role shifting and or picking up, you know, responsibilities based on the need of the startup. And so having an understanding if they're open to that, there are some people who just like to stay in their lane and basically say like, this is my job. Those are not your people. <laughs> just put it to you kindly. Those are not your people. And it's not that there's anything wrong with those people. Those people should absolutely work for a larger organization that allows them to kind of stay in their lane and put those kind of boundaries up. It doesn't work well in early startup. You want to know what their career goals are. And you know what's really cool is that uh, oftentimes, for example, and we had this experience um, with an intern that we had, and we ultimately, like he came in as an intern, and we sort of immediately bumped him up to an analyst, a junior analyst position within Suncoast Ventures. He had a career goal of getting into venture. And that was really great for us because here is somebody that wants to learn it from the inside out. And so he was more than willing to jump in and help support and figure things out and, and was very much a self-starter. Um, and so um, a similar thing happens oftentimes, sometimes people go into work into startups when they think, hey, maybe someday I might want to start a startup or, you know, they have a goal of that. And so that can sometimes be a really good benefit for you in the sense that that's a person that's wanting to really um be more hands-on in terms of learning the ropes and having a better understanding of what it's like to, to run a startup, especially in early days. Um, are they an executor? And I cannot stress this enough. There are people in the world that like to talk and that are strategy people and then there are executors and very, and sometimes you can find them in both. And I like to think of myself as both a strategy person and an executor, but you need to really understand if this is a person who's done things or if this is a person who's told other people how to do things. And so we'll talk a little bit more about the executive team in a minute, but um, one of the biggest mistakes I see in startups hiring is that they hire for the executive team from people that have impressive resumes, but these are not people who are executors. And so what happens is they come into a startup, they don't have the same budget, they don't know how to get their hands dirty, they don't know how to actually, um, um, they don't know how to do that side of the, the house. And so it becomes a very uncomfortable place. Um, and so that's really important. Work style is another thing that's important. Um, thinking about, um, you know, oftentimes startups have weird hours or, you know, you may be getting emails that, you know, and setting some of those boundaries and having a sense of what their work style is, for example, is going to be, is going to be important. Um, and that includes, for example, if you have a distributed team, it's more and more common for that. And it also opens up a lot of worlds for you from a perspective of not necessarily having to hire just in your backyard for people that have the right kind of experience, but, um, you know, for example, are they open to working remotely part of the time or is that something that they would like to do? For example, if, obviously, if they're in the lab, that's a little bit of a difficulty, right? We don't have 
um, remote lab workers, to my knowledge at this point. Um, there's certain kinds of lab work that obviously can be done on the computer that doesn't have to be done in the lab, but that's a little bit more difficult for certain life sciences startups. You know, are they a strategic thinker? Um, and um, and and again, like they kind of need to be an executor and a strategic thinker, especially in early days. Um, it depends on the role that you're hiring for, but especially in your C-suite. You want people that can see big picture, that can think about the higher level business goals, and that, that can get down into the weeds and actually execute with you um, in terms of building your company. Um, they should have a complementary skill set. So hiring lots of people who are just like you, that have a lot of the same background as you, that have a lot of the same knowledge as you, not going to be nearly as helpful as being able to um, hire people who um bring a new skill set in, right? And one of the best things that I see in a founder is somebody that's confident enough to bring in people that are even more talented than they are, which is sometimes, you know, in, in the regular corporate world might be, uh, uh, there There may be egos at play with that. But I will, I will tell you right now, bringing in people with complementary skill set is also something that, that your investors are going to look at. For example, like, do you have someone on your team that has a finance background or that can think through some of these um, operations type things, right? Um, do you have somebody that has a marketing or sales background? If you're, especially if you're a scientific and technical founder, um, and you know those things are important um, for investors because we are going to look at this and say, okay, this is an all PhD team. We're not sure they're going to be able to execute in sales and marketing. Now, that may be a biased judgment call, but it's kind of how, how we look at things in terms of that. And then lastly, communication. So um, how people communicate and the ability to communicate, for example, is this somebody that's going to be open to you? I mean, as an investor, as somebody who is working with um, uh, over 30 startups that I have some stake in, uh, it's not uncommon for me to get texts or emergency sort of requests at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> like if you're in startup world, that's pretty standard. Obviously it's, there's work-life balance to be had wherever you are, but it's something to be aware of. And, and it's not just communication as it relates to, um, you know, are they open to, you know, answering emails um, or making sure that they're prompt in, 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 in communication um, for urgent things. But it's also, can they be a substitute for you? For example, if you're hiring a COO in to compliment you, can that person effectively communicate the vision of the company and be a communicator that can serve at the executive level? And so that's something that's also very important. Let's see. Oops. I'm trying to find my little bubble. There we go. So some key hires. You notice that I have CEO on this list. Um, this is very common for especially life sciences startups to hire an outside CEO. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is in just a minute. Um, a chief operating officer is also a typically a second or you know, a co-founding kind of a kind of a role. CFO is a bit of a tricky one. No one expects an early stage startup to have a full-time CFO. And sometimes it can be a little bit of a red flag if you do, only because they typically tend to be um, highly paid folks. So there are some people who are sort of this COO slash CFO kind of hybrid people, and those are great for startups. Um, but most of the time people have some sort of fractional CFO or someone who serves in that kind of role as an advisor or, or um, some kind of outside group that's not necessarily in full time. Let me just tell you, sales, 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 so growth and the fact that you're going to be and in a life science startup, sometimes it's a long time between when you found and when you actually have a product to sell. Um, and so this may not be a critical first hire, but it's something to be thinking about in terms of like what that sales first looks like. Do you have somebody that has background in sales and marketing that can help you with positioning or help you with strategic partnerships, for example, with pharma or with other, you know, healthcare organizations? Um, because even, and we have, I have a number of startups that are like this, they even prior to, for example, FDA approval of a medical device, you all also often have to have some concept of like 
what are your sales and distribution channels going to be? Who is going to help you take this to market? You know, what are the challenges that you're going to have in convincing, for example, a hospital to adopt your technology? And you as a CEO out fundraising are going to need to be able to answer those questions in a way that satisfies investors. Um, and so whether or not you have somebody in that sales role or sales and marketing or commercialization um, role, Immediately, if you're more of like a biotech or life science startup, you may not need that, but for sure it's something to have on your horizon. And that same is true for like engineering and this engineering is broad. It could be your life sciences startup and you have more people who are in like VP of research, for example, but um, all in all, a lot of time what you're focusing on is product. And depending on what kind of product you're creating, and sometimes it's a digital product, um, there's somebody that should sort of own that or at least have some. And in some companies, this might be the person who's in charge of marketing. In some companies, it very well could be somebody who actually sort of owns the product development side of it. And it could be more an engineering stance or a scientific stance and then customer success. So um, as you're launching into, into market, having somebody who runs the team that is handling how your customers are um, doing with the product is gonna be a really critical hire as well. So I wanna speak just a minute about um, now about and tell a little bit of a story about one of the startups that I'm working with. So you can kind of get a frame of reference for timelines and just how critical it might be in terms of like recruiting and outside folks. So one of the startups that I'm working with here in Oregon is founded by a really smart clinical founder who was an, uh, an oral surgeon who realized that many of her patients were having trouble with eating after surgeries um, and then became more and more intrigued with the concept of there's many, many people, including people with dementia and Parkinson's and other disorder, swallowing disorders that actually are now only able to eat puree or non-solid food. And it's just sort of like um, a devastating addition to their diagnosis in which it's maybe not necessarily, you know, maybe medically they're able to stay alive <laughs> eating this way, but it's, they've lost a lot of the joy um, that, that it comes with eating food and, and being able to have the kinds of um, even nutrition that they, that they might need. And so because she was also a trained chef, she decided to go out on a mission to develop a product for these people that would be safe for them to eat, but that would have some of the functions of a solid food. She partnered with an innovation center in food at Oregon State and developed it. Then she partnered with U of O in order to sort of test this with the experts who are speech language pathologists who are who are who are also often the people who are helping um, with these folks um, in terms of their eating. And then, you know, she's been a solo founder for a long time, for seven years. And what her early stage advisory team looked like was people who just were like, really believed in her. She's got some top-notch advisors from the food and beverage industry. The reason I came on board is she was looking for somebody from the healthcare side of it, and I'm an, an advisor, but she really, really needs a co-founder. And one of the reasons why is, A, she's sort of exhausted and burned out and really needs someone else as invested in her business as she is, but B, she has a certain set of skill sets. She's very clinically knowledgeable. She's very sort of like you know, and she's done a great job at the business side of things for somebody that maybe was trained in, a, in you know, more as a, a clinician, but having somebody that can help with some of these CFO, like COO pro forma type things, helping her with manufacturing and scaling up manufacturing. And so she's currently looking at somebody for that and, and sort of almost like, you know, dating, because it's like, you know, could this person is this person interested? Can we do a salary that fits? Can we do equity that fits? You know, how well do we work together and what does that look like? And so, you know, hiring in an outside person into your company to be a co-founder is sometimes um, uh, uh, really needed, but it's also a really scary time because maybe you've put in seven years in your company on your own. And so bringing somebody else into your baby could be a really difficult, uh, a difficult thing. Um, and if you have any questions, just throw them into the chat. I'm sorry, I meant to, oops, how did I go backwards again? Sorry. Um, so 
one of the other things to think about as you're hiring and you're bringing in your teams is how well are all of these people going to work together? Um, and I have seen organizations as they grow really fail in this spot. And one of the things is you as an early CEO should be doing is not making all the hiring decisions in a vacuum, because especially if you have trusted team members, they are also going to have a lot of insight and input into what it is that your you your team should look like. So I think this is really, really critical um, to make sure of that. And part of that is the advisory team or the advisory board. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And um, I don't know how many of you are already C-Corps. C-Corps technically require a board. That board can just be the founders, <laughs> essentially. So it doesn't have to be outside of that. And I would recommend that in the very beginning, if you are a C-Corp, that you don't rush to fill your board of directors right away. I think that is another mistake that I've seen startups do that they regret later, and then they have to sort of revise that. And I've just been through the process of this with one of the startups that I've invested in. She's having to reconfigure this because she's got a new investor on board that's taking a much bigger role. And quite honestly, they're a little bit disappointed in how the board has been engaged or in, in, in the past. And they're sort of needing to make sure that these people can't block new decisions, given that they just sort of have sat there and not done much of anything. So an advisory board is actually, they both have similar goals. And so I wanted to just frame it from that perspective. They're there to offer guidance to you. And to be quite frank, you don't want anybody on your board as a startup that's not willing to dive in a little bit and pull up their sleeves and help support you. Because to be clear, you need as many hands on deck as possible, but you also want people that are not going to be all up in your day-to-day -day business trying to sort of run the company themselves. And so there's a delicate balance, right? An advisory board is really simple. They're there as advisors. They don't, they often do have some form of equity, um, very small percentages. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those type of percentages typically tend to be. But they're there, you know, and, and they can make a difference, for example, with your investors, especially like if you have really impressive people on your advisory board, what that tells an investor is, these are people from industry with this background or with these other things that really believe in the technology, they believe in the person. And so it can give investors like um, more faith that you are surrounded with people who have knowledge that maybe you have gaps in, for example. And that's going to happen regardless, because in startups, there's no way you're going to have all of that covered in the beginning. And an advisory board is a sort of relatively inexpensive way to help start to fill those gaps in the beginning. So that startup that I mentioned to you in the food space, she's a healthcare person, but she has somebody on her advisory board who was like a VP at Coca-Cola that has a lot of experience in the food business. And that's really critical for her because while she is a chef and she has helped create this product, and she is technically selling a food product into healthcare, having somebody that has the food background and, and that level of experience on her team, especially from a marketing perspective and a branding perspective, it adds credibility, for example. It, myself as an investor is going to look at that and say, oh, that's interesting. She's got real, you know, somebody with really, really solid um, experience launching products before out in the, you know, out in a major brand, right? And that's that you know, for good or for good or for bad, that we we do judge that and look at that and and try to understand um, how that impacts a startup. Board of directors have the ability to fire you. <laughs> I just want to just <laughs> reiterate this, and you've probably heard horror stories of startup founders getting kicked out by their board. I have to tell you. Probably most of the time it was what was best for the business, whether or not it was like, you know, a messy thing or not. But the truth of the matter is they're there to offer guidance as well, but they do have, a, they have authority, they have fiduciary responsibility to do what's best for the company. And they do have some legal responsibility for strategy, action, successes, failures, and they can make some changes, right? So they can vote and the majority of the board can vote to block, for example, terms on an investor deal, they can do all kinds of things. And so 
very thoughtfully putting together your board. And this could be like an entire like week long workshop on board. So I'm not going to like dive into all the details, but it's something that you should be having conversations with other founders about having conversations with your advisors about thinking through this process before you start adding board members on um, because um, they just have a lot more authority, but also responsibility for your startup. And so again, the example I gave earlier of that startup that we invested in and we helped bring another outside investment group in and they're taking a more hands-on approach in, in basically leadership within the company. And then they're looking at this board of directors that's just been sort of sitting there going, where is my money? I, I'm on your board because I invested in you, but I'm not put any effort or energy into the startup or advise or support it in the way that you would want. And so I guess the best thing that I can say is making sure that you are, um, um, and I see some questions in the chat, I'll get to that in just a second, but making sure that you are, um, you are uh, creating the right, the right team. And that includes that your advisor and your advisory board and your board of directors. So I see some questions around how do I find a co-founder <laughs> and then also how do I recruit in a CEO? So um, those are great questions. I think that on finding a co-founder, I think one of the things that one of the, you know, and, and probably the advice is the same for both of these things, which is that um, I often tell startups um, that I'll, sometimes a lot of these like sort of networking events are not necessarily the best use of their time, depending on where they're at. Like sometimes it's a great place to meet investors. Sometimes it's a great place to meet advisors and it depends on where you're at. Sometimes you just need to be heads down, getting your MVP and getting things out the door. But networking events, I know ULP has a lot of these. I know other organizations have a lot of these. It allows you to meet other like-minded um, people who are interested in being parts of startups, maybe they've started startups and ex exited before. One of the other places to go try to meet co-founders is maybe through some of your advisors or through some of your in in investors. If you're at that stage, um, they may also know other people who could be good fits for you. Um, in this case, I introduced this founder to this potential COO, CFO founder she magically came into my radar and I was like, I think that person might be a good fit. It's a little tricky. So um, asking people, you know, um, who are in your trusted circle for um, references or for looking for that is one of the, is probably the best way to do it. Um, you are going to have to offer, so startups typically can't um, pay market rate. So um, reserving equity and giving away equity is one way to attract some of these folks in, into there. Um, I've placed several CEOs into startups um, and they were just a really good fit for the team and for, um, and for uh, their background and experience. And so um, being able to find an experienced CEO that's exited and getting them excited enough about coming onto your team is one way to sort of attract the right talent in. It's not easy, um, but, um, and you can start looking around for and reaching out to people on LinkedIn, for example, that maybe have had other kinds of roles like this in the past. If you can get them excited about, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but if you can get them excited about what it is that you're doing, um, they may start out as an advisor often, um, and then sometimes these people are willing to come in and step in as a, um, as a, as an actual, um, employee or somebody who is, um, more active in the company. Um, but I feel for you and I don't know if that's something that ULP supports in terms of like, um, creating, you know, these kinds of connections, but it typically in my um, experience comes from sort of one-on-one -on -one introductions from trusted partners to people. Um, I have seen, and I want to caution you on this, I have seen there are people who float around the startup community that are sort of looking for these kinds of things. Um, and so vet people very carefully when you are in the process of this, because you want to get their, um, and you want to get their, uh, um, 
their references. You want to talk to people who've worked with them. You want to really vet who they are as people. Yeah, so a CFO is not the fundraiser, to be clear. So, um, and so the person that asked the question about, I know you mentioned may not be as best to hire a CFO early on, but the difficulty is fundraising, especially cover cost of testing. Um, so having somebody on an advisory board that has some financial background or that can help you create a pro forma, which is one of the things that you're probably going to need. Um, and I think Genevieve will probably be talking about that next week when she gets into the financials. So I highly recommend to you, um, Roxanne, to attend that session next Tuesday. Um, and, um, you know, the CFO is not the fundraiser. 100% the CEO is the fundraiser. Um, and, um, there are also people that do a great job of being a fractional CFO, especially for life sciences companies. There are people out there that do that. Um, and that's something to consider if you need somebody with that kind of services. I mean, typically an early stage startup needs somebody that understands grant accounting, <laughs> like that understands, um, things that are, and it's often more of like a, um, a bookkeeper almost than a CFO. Oops, didn't mean to advance. Hold on. Um, let's see. Business oriented leader. Yeah, that's actually something. So Francisco, I want to just call this out and just make this super well known. If you are a scientific and technical founder, the kind of co-founder that you need is somebody that comes with some business savvy and experience and background. So please know that and embrace that and also recognize that the value and contribution that somebody like that brings to your team is probably just as much or equal to the scientific component. Um, and that is because there are many, many great technologies and scientific achievements that have never gone anywhere. And I've seen these kinds of founders because they can't get out of their own way because they don't understand the concept of like, this is really cool technology. Yes, but who is your customer and how are you going to get funded and how are you going to get from here to there? And so having a business co-founder with a technical uh, founder is tremendous and something that like I highly recommend. Um, so, okay, I'm going to keep going here. Um, I cannot stress this enough. And I gave a talk like two weeks ago. And if you saw that, you see that I love to use this picture of my child when she was, <laughs> it's just the giddy excitement of, you know, all of it. And like, you want your advisors to be like this about your startup. You want your team members to be this excited, as excited as you are about the opportunity to create impact in the world that you have with your technology, with your, you know, scientific breakthrough, with whatever it is that you are developing. You want to find your tribe, which is the people who are as passionate about that as you are. And, you know, um, I rarely... Um, take on things as an advisor anymore because I have so many other hats that I wear, but that food startup person got me as excited about her opportunity as she is. And I've dove in with her, you know, that came from her passion for what she's doing. And then also me looking at everything that she's accomplished, just bootstrapping and really being, you know, um, running all the things. Right. And recognizing the value that I had to bring to the table. Sometimes you'll find people who are just as excited as you, but maybe they don't have the bandwidth. Keep those people close. Just keep them updated into what you're doing because they may exit their current startup or opportunity and they could be somebody to join your team. So I think this is something that I think is really critical for you to pay attention to. So I want to just talk briefly, and again, Genevieve is going to be talking a little bit more next week about cap tables and things that most of us are very foreign with when we first come into startup world. Typically, the people who get equity are the people in the C-suite. So the co-founders have different kind of equity than, than what investors get. And again, I'm not going to dive into all of the different, that could be an entirely different, like there's plenty of places online that you can go to get sort of tutorials 
again, I recommend you reading the book Venture Deals, which is a great book that has a lot of this information and kind of will sort you out how all this stuff works. But typically any startup is going to be reserving about 10 to 15 percent of the overall equity for key hires. Um, a, a standard way of doing these things is on a four-year vesting schedule, meaning you don't fully vest into your equity that you're getting granted until your four-year mark with the company or an exit event, whichever comes first. Um, advisors often get equity. Advisor equity shares typically look like something like 0.25 to maybe all the way up to 1%. Um, but advisors, and, and this happens a lot with like business founders that are looking for um, chief medical officers, which is another kind of role within startups. Sometimes they want more like 5% of the company, right? And um, while that's a lot, it may mean it may be the make or break on whether or not your company is, whether or not your product is clinically adopted, if that person is genuinely going to drive the value on engaging KOLs for you, doing some of these other things. And so the ultimately these are your decisions and these are things that you're going to have to decide, but it's just know that giving away equity like candy because it feels like free play money is something that can bite you later with your investors. So thinking really hard, long and hard about who gets a piece of your company and whether or not they're truly committed to you and working with you is, is important. Um, and I want to tell a little quick story. What's my time frame like? I'm not seeing. Okay. So I have a founder who I have invested in and um, he had a co-founder and the co-founder was that clinical person that really had the credibility in the diversity and clinical trial space and had kind of a name recognition but had basically come to the place of like, I'm kind of semi-retired. I feel like I've already contributed to this whole startup thing. I don't really feel like I need to do much of anything else and was not really contributing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, what happened was that I needed to step in co-founder to co-founder, you know, like as somebody who co-founded a, a company that, that um, as well and have a conversation with this this person to say, you know, the equity moving forward is going to be needed for key hires and we need to renegotiate your equity because you're not, a, you know, even though you were originally critical in starting the company, you're not continuing to be a day-to-day -day contributor. And that's going to be a red flag for investors. And it's going to potentially keep the startup from being successful or being able to exit, right? And so, having that hard conversation was difficult, but for example, and I'll just tell you, like, I just took on a very large role at Launch Oregon, and I'm also a startup founder. Right now, I'm good with that, and in fact, it adds to my credibility with working with other university spinouts, because I've been the other half of the university spinout. But at some point in time, for example, if my company was not on its trajectory, that is not really going to be like this venture scalable growing company, but say it was, I would need to step back and bring in another outside CEO to run it. And at which point I would be negotiating, you know, my equity and giving up some of my equity. Similar thing happened when I stepped down from my managing director role into just a venture partner role with Suncoast, even though I was really critical in founding it and had a certain percentage of equity shares based on that effort and my perceived, con you know, continuing effort it's now been, much of that has been released because it needs to go to somebody else that can help fill the gaps of where I will not be able to give the same amount of time. So hopefully that makes sense to you in terms of like, it, again, it's about who is executing day-to-day -day in the company and et cetera are around who gets equity. And um, there could be a whole nother workshop on this. And I don't know whether ULP has ever done this, but I think it would be a great topic for one. I am not necessarily the expert in this. There's many people who are much more skilled than I am on this. And then also just know that sometimes your lawyers might have ideas about what's good or not, but you should gut check those with other people in the startup community. Um, in the end, what we want is everybody on the same mission, right? And so you want a team that is successful because 
that is how you are going to become a rocket ship as a startup. And it is all about the people. So I would say, you know, and especially for investors, they are not investing. You will hear this a lot. They're not investing in the horse. They're investing in the jockey, right? So they are absolutely 100% investing in your team. And many investors, that's almost for the most part, what they look at, right? Um, And so team is such a critical part of building it. And so giving, I know that when you're running a startup, you are wearing so many hats that it's really hard. And one of the things that this founder had said to me yesterday was, I just don't feel like I have the time to figure out all of this hiring of this, you know, of this or that. And I said, but, you know, if you bring on this co-founder, that's one of the things that they can take off your plate. Right. So thinking about how you build that, what your bandwidth is, what your best skills are, and then how do you build a team around you that complements you in that? So um, I'm 